Okay, I guess that's uh, pretty good. Let's go ahead and get started, shall we? Um, right, so welcome everybody. Uh, uh, thanks for joining our first, uh, our first uh, meeting of the, of the new year and, and uh, dare I say of the, uh, of the new era. We had such a, such a lovely day yesterday. Uh, lots of excitement going on. I uh, uh, couldn't be happier. I, 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 I think um, uh, I, I think maybe some of you may may share my sentiment, but uh, I, I think I just I just feel like there's a, been a great boulder lifted off of my chest. Uh, so it's just been it's just been a lovely last couple of days. So uh, that doesn't mean that we're we're done or we're out of the woods. There's still lots of work to be done. Um, uh, but here we are in 2021. Uh, there's finally light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, hopefully at some point uh, in the not terribly distant future, we don't know when exactly yet, but we'll be able to resume, uh, you know, face-to-face -face, uh, in-person uh, um, meetings. And so we'll inform you whether still a, the National Sierra Club still has a, uh, a hold on any um, in-person gathering. So we still are not allowed to do that. And even once the National Club opens that up, we'll wait until it's uh, all fully safe uh, and sound here before we start uh, trying that again. In the meantime, we'll continue with our monthly uh, our monthly Zoom calls. Uh, we've got a, a couple of good ones lined up uh, uh, throughout the spring, so uh, stay tuned for more on that. Um, I, I recognize a great many of the names on the Zoom call, but there's a many that I don't, so I just wanna welcome everybody. Uh, if you are not a Sierra Club member and wish to, to join, uh, it's easy peasy. Uh, head out to our, uh, our website, uh, you can just, and we'll, we'll put that in, in the chat so you can see what the URL is, but if you just Google for uh, Sierra Club Charlotte, uh, it'll pop right up, our, our Sierra Club local group, and uh, you, can, you, can, you can join there. Uh, if you have questions, uh, you can you know, uh, send any of us on, on the leadership team uh, an email. All of our contact information is out there on the website. Uh, it's quite easy to find. Um, we, we, are, we are looking for, uh, uh, besides just joining Zoom calls, uh, increased participation uh, from our members. Uh, if any of you have a desire uh, to get a little bit more involved, we would welcome that very much. Uh, we do, uh, you, you can do as little or as much as you, as you like. Uh, we do have uh, openings on our local uh, XCOM, our executive committee. Uh, our, our bylaws uh, call for seven. And we do have a couple of openings on that. We also have a couple of subcommittees that uh, are uh, that that uh, need a chairman or chairwoman, uh, somebody to, to uh, or somebody even just to start that committee up. Uh, I'm thinking uh, we don't currently have a, a chair of our political committee. Um, we don't currently have a chair of a conservation committee. Uh, there's other opportunities as well. Um, we uh, Roger, who used to do our transportation work. Uh, has has relocated out of state, so there's room to do uh, work with um, with uh, uh, clean and fair and equitable transportation. So lots of opportunities there. Um, we hold our our uh, our uh, our executive committee meetings on the second Tuesday of every month. So far, they're just Zoom calls, uh, and so uh, without even any commitment. If you're just interested to see what we're getting up to, uh, these are open. Everybody is welcome. Uh, drop me an email or, or uh, Rainey, who's on this call, uh, uh, heads our, our uh, communication. Uh, drop one of us an email and ask for an invite, and we'll be sure to include you if you just want to poke your head in. If you have questions, happy to talk with anybody one-on-one -on -one as well. So uh, so shameless plea for, for help and for getting more engaged. Uh, nothing too onerous. Uh, we do tend to have a lot of fun. And um, so... Uh, so there's that. We are going to uh, uh, not necessarily do a round robin of our XCOM members for committee reports because, frankly, because of the pandemic and our uh, our you know relegated to to, to Zoom only calls, uh, not a lot to report there. Um, uh, outings uh, are uh, just like our face to face meetings, outings and service outings. So outings like hikes and bike rides and kayak trips are on hold. Service outings. Um, are, are on hold as well. Uh, and again, we hope to resume those, uh, you know, in the not terribly distant future, but uh, certainly not before it's uh, safe to do so. So thanks for everybody for, for joining. So um, without further ado, uh, we'll uh, jump right into our, our, uh, our topic tonight, um, uh, ecology gardening, making your yard a better place. Our speaker uh, is a friend of mine, uh, uh, Dan Jakovovitz. Uh, and he has his own his own uh, 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 company, Echo Backyards, 
that does habitat construction uh, and ecological kind of landscape design. So uh, Dan's uh, been working in this in this area for many many years. Uh, he's currently the president of of Hawk. Uh, it's the Matthews chapter of the uh, NC Wildlife Federation. And uh, I've worked with, with Daniel on a couple of his uh, events out in Matthews as well. Uh, great person. Uh, and uh, so Dan, I'll turn it over to you without further ado. All right, thank you very much. Oh, welcome everybody. I will uh, share my screen here, get this on. Let's see if that is cooperating. All right. That look right, Jerry? You able to see that? Looks great. All right. So welcome, everybody. I appreciate you guys coming out. I will try and make this uh, informative and uh, inspiring. Uh, we've got a lot of good things uh, uh, ahead of us for uh, this evening. Uh, I am a father of a 15-year-old daughter, so she uh, tends to think I'm a little bit more preachy and judgmental, so I will try not to be that. Uh, if you hear that in my tone on some things, not my intention. All right, uh, so let's have fun. What is, uh, doesn't wanna advance. Oops, there we go. All right. So, you know, we really ask a lot from our environment, our ecosystems. Um, PowerPoint suggested these icons uh, for me uh, over here. And uh, I found the one for food so, so fantastic um, that uh, I thought I'd go ahead and, uh, and leave that uh, in there. Not really sure what they were thinking about clean air at the top, but uh, these are the things that we need, right? To survive, um, all living things uh, need. Uh, in addition, you know, there's a lot of other things that we get from our environment, from, uh, from our ecosystem and, uh, and, and certainly pollination of crops uh, like corn, for instance, when pollinated. Um, so these are the type of things that, that you know, we're, we're requiring uh, to survive. Uh, pest management would be another one. Uh, let's just soak this picture in for a moment. You know, there's plenty of things to talk negative and, and harmful environmentally. Uh, but uh, let's take a nice deep breath and really uh, get to uh, appreciate this. This is what yesterday felt like for me. I know Jerry mentioned uh, we did have a, a lovely day, uh, all of us. And, uh, and this is what nature should be, right? We should all uh, certainly enjoy this. And one of the things that we get, of course, uh, is the, the appreciation and, and, and the opportunity to go and be out in nature. So that is another piece that we get. Uh, from our environment. You know, I've been a, an investment advisor uh, for many years and uh, I'm a fiduciary and trying to explain to people what a fiduciary is. I would show them this picture of our, uh, of our dog a couple of boxers ago. Uh, this is Rose, she was a therapy dog. And there's my daughter uh, in, uh, in the front yard, uh, enjoying the sitting out there and having a uh, having a fun time. Well, Rose is a fiduciary. She would lay her life down to protect Katie. Uh, that is what a fiduciary is. That's why they call dogs Fido, is it comes from fiduciary, uh, fidelis, loyalty. And so we have a fiduciary responsibility, not only to our children and our pets and our families and our planet, um, but to, to nature and to each other. And so this is such a fantastic picture. Katie didn't think I was too judgmental back then. Um, we've got Marley behind me over here. It's a, another white boxer that, that we've, we've rescued. Um, so, you know, when we're talking about uh, what ecology gardening is, uh, you know, the mindset of it, when you see this picture, a uh, beautiful big house, a uh, lot of property, um, you know, what do, we, what do we keep in mind uh, while, we're, while we're gardening here? Uh, we've got a nice big buffer of trees uh, between the properties, so that's fantastic. It'd be wonderful if there were big corridors for wildlife uh, between properties and uh, opportunity for you know, habitat and, uh, uh, and, and shelter. Well, you know, what's, 
what I see when I look at this, I see a lot of erosion around this pond. I see uh, a lot of uh, fertilizer runoff. Uh, if you notice over at the, uh, the, the ditch between the house and the, and the pond there, uh, certainly it's considerably more green. So that means the fertilizer didn't stay on the lawn, but rather uh, ran down. Um, you know, we've got that erosion. It's missing nature here, and uh, it's missing a buffer along the, uh, along the water to keep erosion at bay, keep you know, pollutants at bay. So we're looking at the big picture is really what ecology gardening is. Uh, you know, here's your, is this a typical suburb? Um, maybe not, those houses seem to have uh, quite a good amount of space uh, between them. Uh, certainly some nice chunks of, uh, of mature trees and, and, uh, and whatnot, an opportunity for habitat. Uh, a lot of lawn, of course, you know, Americans, Americans do love the lawn, big dead zone. Maybe this is more of a traditional suburb, uh, tiny lawns, all those little spots ought to be gardens. Um, don't have to mow it, don't have to really take care of it uh, that way. Here's a riparian buffer over in Singapore. Nice space between that uh, going through opportunity for flooding uh, without taking out buildings and, and property. Uh, certainly uh, nice greenery all the way down there. Uh, this is fantastic it's the kind of thing that, uh, that cities should have, just a lot more of them, right? So looking at ecology when we're, when we're gardening, here's a perfect example of it. Uh, and this is certainly a, a city with with millions and millions of, uh, of residents. You know, really the question uh, that I ask is, is really what your goal is. So here's your typical suburban house in Charlotte, right? You got the green lawn, uh, you got a couple of green meatball bushes up against the foundation. Um, and this is, you know, other than the, than the couple of trees, can't quite tell exactly what those are, but let's call them maples. So other than the maples offering some, uh, some habitat and some opportunity for insects to, uh, uh, to get into and birds, insects and all that, uh, it's, it's kind of a dead zone. It's kind of a desert, not really much there. Of course, the lawn, very unhealthy gardening practices, fertilizers, fungicides, all that kind of fun stuff. But, uh, you know, so are we looking for superficial decorating with plants that aren't native or uh, over here on the right, a friend of mine's garden uh, right outside her kitchen window. Fantastic, even got a little visitor to, uh, to come and, uh, and say hello. Uh, this is, she's a beekeeper and her bees are certainly have a, a nice treat right at home. They don't have to fly too far to get uh, the things that they need uh, as well as birds and, and, and whatnot. So, you know, are we, are we really after a uh, uh, creating a healthy ecology, healthy habitat? We are certainly constrained. There's a lot of things that uh, that keep us from being able to uh, uh, to do this, right? I mean, uh, we've got uh, poor soil quality, urban environments. The soil is uh, is is certainly uh, uh, horrible. Bringing in compost and, and, and amendments to be able to uh, get those type of uh, properties, you know, anything to really grow in a healthy way. You know, that picture that I showed you with those homes so close together, where is, where are the, the where's the wildlife? You know, where are they, do you think are hiding? They're, they're, they're not, they're not in the area. Uh, birds fly over that. It's again, it's a desert. They just keep on going. There's, there's no one for them. Uh, Big issue that we have, uh, and I'll, we'll get into invasive species a little later on, certainly uh, natural disasters here in Matthews. We had uh, a tornado, first one I've ever been a part of, uh, took out a lot of trees, a lot of big, mature, beautiful trees. And it's disappointing, certainly. But if you have many other saplings growing, you know, you have that, that next stage, you have that succession planning uh, always uh, on, on the horizon. A big issue certainly for a lot of folks is finding the materials, finding good quality soil, finding good compost, finding native plants. Um, 
feel free to contact me. I'll be glad to point you guys in the right direction. Some, some great folks uh, here locally. All right, we have certainly people's uh, mindset is another constraint, right? These social constraints, uh, what one person thinks is beautiful, uh, another person might think is a weedy lawn. Uh, another one uh, sees a lawn and thinks that's horrible. So it's certainly something that we need to educate folks on what a, a prairie lawn, for instance, might be, or what a pollinator garden uh, is. Money and time certainly is a, a big challenge to help uh, the, the uh, rather uh, uh, obstructs folks from making things. And there's always uh, folks who are afraid of nature. You know, I've got a picture of a, a, a it's, heck, it's a cartoon snake and people get creeped out by it. Um, so there are a lot of people who are very afraid of any insect, any caterpillar, certainly the snakes. Um, and of course, just simply the, well, that's what we've always done. That's really sad but uh, that certainly is the way, uh, the way it is. We certainly have opportunities and uh, restoring uh, nature to the land is uh, I would argue our fiduciary responsibility is being good land stewards and uh, being able to do the things I'm about to, uh, to talk about uh, not only uh, brings in the wildlife, uh, brings in uh, the plants, it brings in life um, and uh, and like we were talking earlier with the tornado that, uh, that shot uh, not too far from my home, uh, when you have plants that are uh, the next stage, uh, they, and they buffer each other. You know, you have one tree standing 65 feet up in a field, uh, it knocks down fairly easy. But when you have 30 of them buffering each other, uh, they can withstand storms like that considerably better. All right. So... What is it that, uh, that we could do? First of all, that license plate was fantastic. Uh, driving behind that person was, uh, was a lot of fun. So choosing natives is, is, is at the beginning. You know, the big issue with, uh, with native plants versus non-native plants, uh, if you're not familiar with this, uh, with this debate, uh, native plants and native insects have evolved with each other. And there are certain insects that are uh, specialists, they will only lay their eggs on that one plant. That's it. That's all they're going to lay their eggs on. So when, for instance, there's no milkweed, you don't get monarch butterflies because they will only lay their eggs on milkweed. Now there's a variety of different kinds of milkweed, but uh, in different parts of the country. But if the farmers are cutting them down and we're not planting them in our garden because it's got the word weed in it, and uh, you know we don't want weed. We don't want all these weeds, we want weed killer, right? No, we don't. So planting native plants is critical. Um, I've got a, I've got a little light over here. It's kind of blocking my screen, my apologies. So fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides, insecticides, all of these things are, uh, are, are killers. So instead of using those, there's a lot of opportunity, for instance, if you have insects, uh, for instance, if you have slugs, I would argue you don't need chemicals to take care of that. You actually have a different problem. You don't have enough bugs. You don't have enough frogs. You don't have enough snakes. You don't have enough ducks, chickens in your yard. So we've removed those other things, the predators of, the, of our enemies. So if you're not happy with a certain insect or, or whatnot in your, in your, on your property, find who eats that. It's a heck of a lot better, much better uh, uh, solution. You know, mice get hawks and owls uh, and bite them over to your, to your property. So the ones that I have underlined here, those are the most important. Removing invasives, oh my goodness. Uh, I'll sh get into that, I'll show you guys some pictures. Uh, phenomenal, the invasive plants that are still available at Home Depot, Lowe's and all the other big box garden stores. Uh, English ivy, wisteria, nandina, Legustrums, these are all things that you can still go by. And meanwhile, they're in our woods, just, just eating our, our woods and smothering all the native plants out of there. Um, you know, limiting how much you, you water is certainly uh, important, uh, particularly with natives, you don't have to water them uh, nearly as much. You certainly have to, when you plant them, you have to you know, take care of them for a good while. Maybe you 
maybe a year, uh, particularly through the summer down here in Charlotte. And knowing what you're planting and knowing the conditions that a particular plant uh, needs is critical. But my absolute favorite out of all of this is uh, kick back, grab your favorite beverage, maybe some M&Ms or something, and uh, just look at your garden. Let it be. You don't need to rake all those leaves. You don't need to, uh, you don't need to take care of cutting all those uh, dead leaves and stems and everything else off of your plants. Leave them because all your native uh, insects really want to be in there for the winter. And I'll show you that in a minute. I think you guys already know my opinion on lawns, but if you're gonna have one, uh, go ahead and mow them high, add some uh, white clover. That's a, it's not a native, but it's fantastic. Uh, it's a legume, so it fixes nitrogen. It produces fertilizer for the soil, uh, stays green. And matter of fact, if you have a nice stand of it, you really don't even have to mow it. It only gets up maybe about four or five inches. So it's perfect. Compost pretty much fixes everything. It's my cure-all. Instead of reaching for fungicides, you reach for the compost that has fungus in it, uh, but they have the good fungus, good bacteria uh, that'll help your soil, help your plants. And of course, all of this creates habitat. And we'll, uh, we'll look into a little bit of that. This is one of my biggest pet peeves. I know you guys see this almost everywhere you go. And now, uh, if you hadn't paid attention after this and the next slide, you're definitely going to see this, unfortunately, everywhere you go. So tap people on the shoulder and let them know that they're doing it all wrong and how they can do it much better because a pencil stuck in the dirt is not the way you plant a tree. Um, you get these roots, you get root rot. Uh, there's a root flare that is supposed to be above the ground. This root collar is uh, perfect in this image. This is what it's supposed to look like. The above ground cells and then there's below ground cells. So the roots, they can stay moist and stay under you see these people mound their mulch like a volcano. And uh, the answer really is a donut. Now I'm not a fan of having a lawn so close because the weed whacker is gonna nick this, uh, the anchors on this tree over here. But uh, this is certainly better than, uh, than just mounding all that mulch on it. So uh, about three feet of uh, mulch around all this would be great. And all of what that tree root collar being exposed should still be exposed when the when the mulch is applied. All right, if you guys don't know Doug Tallamy, Dr. Doug Tallamy, uh, we had him present for us over in uh, online a couple of months back and uh, probably one of my favorite uh, guys. And this is his study talking about what birds need. They need a lot of squishy bugs, a lot of bugs, particularly the squishy ones, to, uh, to raise their young. You know, they can eat seeds when they're older, but, uh, but the babies, I think you've seen them feed their, uh, their babies. You've seen videos of that. They kind of just cram that, that food in there, right? So uh, ideally, it needs to be some soft stuff that, uh, that mama is, uh, is cramming down those babies' uh, throats. And they need a lot of them. So uh, this is a, a great article, it's a great study. Uh, if, uh, at the end of this presentation, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll show you uh, one of uh, his books that was uh, truly like an epiphany for me uh, years ago uh, when I saw him uh, in person here in Charlotte five years ago, six years ago. And then uh, he just did a presentation for us, which uh, uh, go on YouTube, type in Doug Tallamy, you can find a bunch of his, uh, his presentations. You know, ditching pesticides uh, is an obvious one. Uh, the mosquito sprays take out all of our uh, natural assassins that we want, like these ladybugs. Uh, you know, there's so many other insects that, that you want in your, on your property to keep all the pest insects away. And of course, if you get rid of them all, then those birds don't come. And they're taking care of uh, a lot of them for you as well. All right, we talked about earlier here is a property uh, very close to downtown Charlotte. Uh, the picture on the left is the same spot as the picture on the right. Uh, it was hired to chainsaw into this property. It was like uh, being Tarzan, trying to find what we even had in here. Unfortunately, almost everything that you see in that left picture is uh, invasive wisteria, Chinese wisteria. 
there is an American uh, wisteria. It's not as showy. So we've imported the Asian version, which is much showier. They're both fragrant. They're both very, you know, very uh, strong plants, but the American wisteria doesn't do this. It doesn't take over uh, your whole property. It's not invasive and uh, it stays relatively within bounds. This is uh, still an ongoing uh, project, but uh, just in the first six feet, which we didn't even know was there, uh, is this crate myrtle. And it was probably, probably you, don't, you don't see the top of it, but it's probably about 25 feet uh, tall. And uh, so we're gonna see if it survives. Uh, in the back of this lot, here is my arborist, who's a pretty stout fella. So you can see his hand on a tree that is actually a wisteria vine. And there's eight of these wisteria vines about that same thickness over here. The tree that you see to the right is about four feet away that I didn't get one picture with all of that. Um, that wisteria vine isn't even touching the tree until about 25 feet up in the air. Uh, and it probably hadn't been there maybe, maybe not even 10 years. So it grows crazy fast, which what makes it so bad. Smothers everything, girdles things, uh, girdles trees, as you can see on, on the right. There's a lot of English ivy there too. Uh, again, both those plants available at your local stores uh, shouldn't be. So right behind Tobias down there is also Mahonia, another invasive plant that you can get at your local big box store. So we cut all this off to expose this beautiful big uh, willow oak. And this went up the whole length of the tree. Uh, it's a nice big, barely mature uh, willow oak and we're gonna see if it survives. Um, so we won't know for a while. We didn't cut all of everything off. We cut it off the bottom. Don't wanna sun scald this tree. It's been uh, used to have wearing this coat for a long time, but uh, that is invasive plants. And so this is in an urban environment. Can you imagine just out in the, in the woods? So, oops. All right, so planting the right plant in the right place is, uh, is critical, right? So uh, trees, power lines, so if you plant the wrong tree under those power lines, this is what Duke Power's subcontractor arborists are gonna do to your tree. Uh, none of those are good. Not good for the tree, not good for you, not good for aesthetics, it's, it's terrible. So knowing what you have, what you're working with, so go with what you're working with. Uh, you know, so many people wanna change what they have. Uh, if they've got a, a, a boggy area in their, in their yard, uh, plant a rain garden. Plant something that will work there. Uh, there's plenty of plants that'll work uh, and have wet feet. And there are plenty, of course, that uh, absolutely will not survive there uh, as well. So, you know, read the weeds. So uh, dandelions and crabgrass grow in compacted soil. So you need to decompact it. And earlier I mentioned compost is the answer. Compost is the answer to a lot of gardening woes. So compost is actually a, a, a fantastic way to decompact your soil. Being a lazy gardener is, uh, is what I'm trying to show you here. All the stems, all the leaves that your neighbors put on the curb and spend a lot of time and a lot of blower noise and pollution uh, are getting rid of all these things. So instead, so the Luna Moth, uh, one of our native trees, a uh, sweet gum, a lot of folks don't particularly like sweet gums, I don't like them around a driveway or walkways with those gumballs, but certainly they're fantastic. And you can get this Luna Moth. Uh, you know, I wish that it had somebody's hand holding that one because Luna Moths are about the size of my palm. Uh, they overwinter in the leaves that are on the ground. So you blow all those leaves away, you're blowing away a whole bunch of Luna Moths and a whole bunch of other stuff too. So leave them. Uh, the stems of your plants, be a lazy gardener, leave all the stems. Native bees will, uh, will find them and, uh, and overwinter in them. So wait until your plants have greened up significantly before you cut all these uh, stems away. If you do need to neat things up in spring, 
And then when you do, don't throw them away. Don't put them in the compost pile. Tuck them in the side of the, you know, gently throw those uh, branches and those stems uh, and let the, all the, the larvae make their way out. Some of them, you know, a little sleepy, don't get out right away. I love driving down the road uh, when I'm doing projects and, uh, and I need a bunch of leaves. Uh, I know this house is using paper bags, which are compostable. Charlotte Mecklenburg, by the way, gives these away for free. So uh, you can get those uh, arguably pretty much as much, many as you might need, but I encourage you to need none of those and keep all the leaves and put them underneath your bushes and under, around your trees and leave them on your lawn and let all those insects and all those creatures overwinter and wait to mow it in in spring. Take your time, like I said, be lazy. One of the things that I like about these is I get plenty of free ladybugs and other of those insects that we were just talking about when I rescue these bags and I bring them to uh, my yard or my clients, my friend's yards. And so uh, if you don't know what this little creature is, it's right above it, it says ladybugs. So this is a ladybug larva. Uh, they look like little alligators and they are ferocious pest predators. It is fantastic. You know, if you've got some aphids on your plants, you don't need to worry about it. You get a couple of these guys, uh, Renfro hardware, a lot of Ace hardware stores, that kind of old timey hardware stores, they sell ladybugs in uh, little containers in the spring and summer. Never get the ones that are on the counter because they're gonna be warm and they're gonna all be very active. You wanna get one that's in the refrigerator, not the freezer, but the refrigerator at the store. Bring them home, maybe even have a cooler, keep them in a cooler on your way home. Uh, when you get home, spray your yard with water. That's the only kind of spraying you ought to be doing. Uh, get everything nice and, uh, uh, and moist for them. And when you start releasing them and they're cool, they won't wanna fly away. They'll move much slower. And so they'll hang out. They'll have a drink of water right away because they'll be thirsty and they'll stick around and hopefully lay some eggs in your, uh, in your garden. And the adults, the ladybugs that we are familiar with seeing, uh, they'll go ahead and uh, eat plenty of aphids and plenty of other uh, fun uh, pests in your garden as well. But uh, these little babies, these are what you're really after. So when you see this crawling around, uh, of course, they don't bite us, so you're more than welcome to pick them up gently and enjoy them. You really want to invite the whole food chain. Uh, <laughs> this image, uh, really the only thing that bothered me about this image is that it has grass as a plant, and, and I'm kind of the opposite. I don't mind native grasses, and you know, like, uh, uh, nope, can't even think of one off right off the top of my head right now, but uh, obviously plants start everything and insects are the, the, really that primary food source for all the creatures because not too many are going to want to eat the plants, right? So insects are eating the plants. Everybody else eats insects. And in a lot of cultures, of course, humans eat insects, you know, chocolate covered grasshoppers. Um, hadn't quite made it to the U.S. Uh, <laughs> too much, but really all of this quite honestly, starts with the soil, the decomposers, the fungi is, uh, is really phenomenal. I had mentioned earlier, compost the answer uh, to a lot of gardening problems. And the, the bacteria, the, uh, the nematodes, uh, the, the fungi, you know, the bacteria goes ahead and actually creates glues that keep soil from eroding. So I did a project for a client and uh, she had a lot of erosion. We built some stairs up on a, on a bank and uh, packed it full of compost. And so the erosion from all the rain that we have drastically, drastically improved and it will only improve even further as the bacteria continues to grow in that compost and, and, and truly glue that soil together. The fungi breaks into the soil and helps with compaction. Um, and of course, mushrooms are the fruit of the fungi. So there's tons and tons of fungi that we don't see underground in the wood itself. And then this is the fruiting and sporing bodies of that, uh, of that organism. <laughs> I love this. I love this quote. I wish I knew who to attribute it to. Uh, you can eat them all, but mm, a couple of them are going to kill you. So there is a whole economy going on uh, underground in the soil. So Trees can't grow without fungi. 
And what's cool is that the fungi will go ahead and coat the, uh, uh, the roots and some of them actually penetrate different kind of fungi. But the trees go ahead and give the fungi and the bacteria sugars and the fungi go ahead and uh, make available the nutrients that are already there in the soil but the tree can't just get on its own. Uh, so what a uh, beautiful symbiotic relationship here. Uh, lots to talk about here, but uh, that's kind of the uh, kind of the the nutshell of it. Again, why compost is the answer. Compost is full of bacteria, well, healthy bacteria. So if your compost stinks and it's sour, well, then that's anaerobic. It went, it sat in a bag too long. It got wet too long. Whatever the case might be, that's not what you're looking for. Uh, you want something that smells just earthy and almost like inert. Just smells smells nice and sweet best I can describe it. So when you're buying a plant uh, from the garden shop, I always recommend pull it out of the, out of the pot because it's been sitting there probably in the sun. So half of it's been cooked uh, during the day. The other is kind of, you know, sitting there, it's kind of been shady. So if you pop it out, you'll notice the roots on the hot side are usually uh, uh, dead if they've gotten too hot and they haven't been shaded enough. And, uh, and so if you pull that pot out and you give it a, a, a sniff and the pot didn't smell like nothing, don't buy that plant. You've got anaerobic bacteria in there. You're, you're already got a, uh, the top might look nice. It might be blooming, but your plant's uh, in decline. That's not a good plant to buy. Little tip. All right. So here is a, uh, the Charlotte, the Mecklenburg uh, Cooperative Extension Agents uh, just posted this a couple of days ago. And this is a North Carolina home uh, in an HOA controlled community. And this is the garden she went ahead and got permission to go ahead and build. And to think of all of the life that she brought back into uh, her garden here. Uh, not to mention, don't have to mow any of that uh, anymore. So this is fantastic. This is a, a gorgeous example of not a huge piece of land and, uh, and doing, uh, doing a great thing. You know, certainly, the beauties in the eye of the beholder, as I mentioned earlier, uh, not really much going on up top there, but that's kind of your typical garden, right? So I much preferred this down here below. So Spokane, Washington went ahead and had this, stole it off of their Facebook page. Love this picture. You know, one of the easiest thing to do is, uh, is plant from seed. So the it's certainly very inexpensive there's uh, there's seed swaps there are people that you can go and get free seeds from matter of fact the uh, north carolina botanical garden gives away free seeds of their plant of the year their wildflower of the year um, this year i believe it is the uh, beauty berry uh, absolutely love beauty berry gorgeous if you don't know it look it up you will love it too uh, beautiful uh, purple berries uh, clustered together about the ping pong ball size uh, and they're pom pom you know, along a stem. They're not just all in one big bunch. Very cool. Um, just make sure if you're going out to buy beauty berry, you're buying the native variety. So whenever we're talking about all these plants, uh, they, you, you can, these common names, uh, you have native variety, like a maple, right? You got Japanese maple, kind of name gives it away. It's not, not a native plant. Uh, so using uh, an ecotype, from a, a, a from a plant, it could be native to America, but it's really like a Northwest milkweed, for instance. Um, so that's not the the local milkweed that we have here in the Carolinas. Um, but what's cool about throwing seeds out is if it's not the right condition for them, they're not going to survive. Uh, so you don't go and plant something and then realize it, it dies. Uh, it'll plant itself, and you broadcast a whole bunch out there. Um, and things move around, right? These things will reseed themselves and uh, they, will, they will survive. You still have to take care of them, right? While they're getting established, but it's a nice inexpensive downright, you know, free way of, of, of doing it. If, uh, if you've got folks to, to donate you some seeds. All right, here's a project that we did. This is fantastic. So we needed to remove this tree It's dangerous pine tree, but instead of getting rid of the whole tree, we topped this pine tree. It went up probably a good 60 feet. It was uh, definitely in danger of landing on 
uh, the client's house and uh, it was up on a hill far enough that it would have had a lot of momentum by the time it hit the house. But here we can leave a 25 foot snag, snag's just simply a, a dead tree that's standing. And we carved out these compartments and, uh, and made a little bird hotel. Uh, so we made uh, four compartments in there. There's Tobias uh, uh, ready to put on that, uh, the face of, the, of the, the farthest one here. And, uh, and it's fantastic, you know, uh, so when you see dead trees standing, uh, really pay attention to them. They're full of insects, they're full of life. Uh, and and they, they generally don't fall down nearly as much. Wind load, almost nothing on this. So it could survive a storm now, as opposed to when it had a top on it. Um, and this is where, you know, wildlife, this is what wildlife really needs. And it's a lot of fun to, uh, to make these and see who comes. Because we cut down trees that are dangerous, that would have cavities, we need to put up habitat for uh, creatures like barred owls. We have a lot of barred owls in the Charlotte area. They are fantastic uh, to hear. You can hoot with them. They'll, they'll hoot back to you if, uh, if you get it right. Sometimes they sound like, uh, like crazy monkeys. Um, <laughs> they get that, that sound. I can't quite do it. I wish I had an audio file for you. But, but here's Tobias about 45 feet up in, a, uh, in this tree, putting up a, a, a barred owl box. And uh, this, is, uh, this is our favorite thing to do. No chainsaw uh, on days like that when we're working in trees. Heck of a lot better to put up uh, habitat. Now when you're sighting these, just uh, keep in mind, if you're going to put an owl box, not only do you want to put it up about 35, 45 feet up, but you also want to sight it where the, when the, uh, when the babies fledge out, they're going to hop up on that perch and then they're going to glide out. So you don't want to put it where they're going to crash into some things. You want to put it where uh, they'll have a, an area to glide out and then they're going to come back, climb up the tree and do it again. That's how I'm going to learn how to fly. So you also don't want to put it where there's a fence, particularly a chain link fence, where they're not going to be able to get back over. At least split rail fences, there's wood there for them to get their, their talons in because they're going to just crawl or, or walk right up the side of the tree back to the, to the box. Uh, so they can make it over a split rail fence. Chain link, not so much. Other types, you know, same problem. Ground bees. This is interesting. This is from a uh, landfill reclamation project in, uh, in New York, New Jersey area. And they have a lot of uh, native bees. Matter of fact, a lot of our native bees are ground bees. Most people think of uh, wasps, right? Uh, that, uh, that have a hornet's nest in the ground. Um, but many, many of our uh, bees, bumblebees. So this is interesting. So they built, uh, they wanted to see what kind of soil the local native bees preferred. Uh, so they had uh, more sandy, more clay, and uh, you know Goldilocks in the middle there. Um, so it was, uh, this is a very interesting habitat that you can build very easily in your backyard. Uh, no watering required. And so leaving some bare ground for your bees uh, is important. One of my favorite plants and one of my favorite bees. So if you don't know this plant on the right, uh, this beautiful heart-shaped leaf is a red bud. And so this bee is a leaf cutter bee and uh, she lines her nest with all these little cutouts. And the first time I saw this years ago, I could have sworn someone was uh, you know, coming onto my property and using a hole punch. Cause look at those, look at those, they're just almost perfectly circular. Um, and so they are completely not harmful for the, to the tree. And they, these guys work together. They do particularly like red bud leaves. All right. So this Eastern tiger swallowtail, um, the one on the right happens to be at a nursery on the Joe Pye weed. So what a great advertisement. Uh, I'll give Ross Farms over here in Charlotte a uh, a plug because they even keep bees on site. They don't use pesticides on their plants for exactly this reason. Um, the Eastern Tiger Swallowtail, by the way, is a state butterfly, not only North Carolina, but also South Carolina, Georgia, Tennessee. We have a lot of Eastern Tiger Swallowtails in, uh, in the United States. 
Um, but they are specialists also. They require, um, just like the monarch, uh, certain plants. So when you see this caterpillar, this hungry, hungry caterpillar, um, munching away on that milkweed leaf, the milkweed in the middle there is uh, your common milkweed, uh, butterfly weed to your left, um, much bigger, the milkweed uh, in the middle, the common milkweed, uh, but great plant. Pollinators like them. You see bees and and uh, and 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 wasps coming to uh, to get nectar from it as well, but they don't lay their eggs on it. But the monarch, that is the only plant that it will lay its eggs on. So if we don't have milkweed, we don't have monarchs. And I know that the uh, we've done a great job from an advertising campaign for a few years now. But monarchs are in massive decline. Um, they used to line farm fields. And, and they're, I got to be honest, they're a little bit of a pain in the butt uh, because they're, they're, they're sappy. And I don't blame a farmer for not wanting that in the midst of his, of his crop. Uh, but we used to have plenty of it and now we don't. And so it's really up to us as good land stewards to plant these native plants so we can keep the heritage that we have instead of seeing these guys go away. And even Marley likes um, monarch <laughs> butterflies. Uh, they are, they really are the, uh, the quintessential uh, butterfly that everybody can recognize, um, but they are in uh, grave danger. So please help us out. Another uh, lovely plant, uh, passion vine, you get a couple of wonderful plants, a couple of but wonderful uh, 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 butterflies that will come and, uh, and lay their eggs on it, eat it. And, uh, and pupate into uh, these beautiful uh, uh, butterflies. And in the meantime, you get this gorgeous uh, flower. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with, with May Pops, but uh, uh, it's a beautiful little, I don't even know how to describe it because if, uh, sometimes it tastes more tart, the little fruit that comes out of it. But if, uh, if you have an opportunity, you can get, get yourself a, a passion vine and, uh, and let that fruit ripen on it. Uh, a good long while, pop one off and, and you can even eat the seeds in it. But if you eat the, uh, the pulp and spit the seeds all around the garden, you'll get a whole bunch more of these vines uh, growing. All right, so you guys, uh, I should have had this slide kind of um, blocked where you couldn't see which is which, but the Viceroy uh, uses mimicry uh, because the, the monarch is poisonous. It eats milkweed, which is poisonous, makes it poisonous. Um, so uh, it tastes really bad to birds. So birds don't bother to eat them. And so the Viceroy over time has evolved to mimic. Um, the only way to tell, it took me a while when I first saw this too. Uh, do you see the line that is going parallel with the, with the edge of the right Viceroy? That is how you would tell the difference. You know, good luck when it's flying along uh, and fluttering its wings to, uh, to see that. But uh, willows are the host plant. Matter of fact, it's the only host plant. Again, viceroys are specialists. A lot of these insects are specialists. So you've got uh, Eastern tiger swallowtail that will also, uh, uh, that you know, willows could be a, a, a host plant for uh, morning cloaks and uh, Eastern commas, but they will, they can host on other plants. The viceroy only willow, and I'm not talking about weeping willow, which almost everybody is familiar with. That's an Asian type of willow. We're talking about the native willow. Um, so plant one and you will have the spice bush, great plant, very cool uh, caterpillars and beautiful butterfly. So uh, when the, the first stage is green, the second stage is even bigger and is got uh, this, this orangey color uh, and it uses uh, these, these eyes to make it look like a little baby snake to keep predators from eating it. Its head is actually all the way almost under that side with those fake eyes. Um, very cool. Tulip poplars uh, also will host spice bush swallowtails. Um, tulip poplars are humongous, gorgeous uh, trees. These, all these are, uh, are native trees here. Um, so plant them and leave their leaves. Uh, because the, uh, 
the spice bush swallowtail caterpillar will actually uh, use some sort of, uh, they make a silk and they, they make a little sleeping bag out of their leaves and they're hanging out in the leaves uh, for them to take that next instar and uh, turn into a butterfly. What you can do, certainly certifying your yard. Uh, there's a lot of organizations out there. Um, North Carolina uh, Wildlife Federation, or the, excuse me, the National Wildlife Federation has a uh, certified wildlife habitat um, certification uh, that I encourage folks to not only learn about. Uh, uh, Xerces is uh, all about butterflies. Uh, Monarch Watch um, is creating these butterfly way stations. Um, again, all of these if you did everything in my list, you would qualify for a certified yard uh, easily. You know, food, water, shelter, place to raise their young, not using chemicals. Basically, you're building habitat. That's what we're after. So uh, I thank you very much for uh, your attention. And I wish you, you know, all the best with everything that you're going to do building your uh, wildlife uh, beautiful gardens. These are two of my favorite books. Um, Dr. Mel Larry Melichamp uh, was over at UNCC, uh, recently retired. He's got a couple of great books. This one's my favorite. A uh, lot of great information on why you would want this particular native plant or what might be dangerous about it. And uh, Dr. Doug Tallamy, uh, that's one of his first books I read. He just had another recent one, um, Nature's Best Hope. By the way, we are Nature's Best Hope to do all this. And will do real well. Here are a couple of the resources that I'm a big fan of. I appreciate it. I imagine we have a couple of questions. I wasn't able to see the... Uh... Yes, uh, we do have a couple of questions. Jane Tanner would like to know, how do you get rid of wisteria without chemicals? Yeah, so wisteria is a good one, right? Uh, it <laughs> It's tough. So there's a couple of different ways. One, of course, uh, manually removing it. Uh, the, the property that I showed you earlier that was just the total Tarzan jungle of wisteria, um, the ground actually had about eight layers of, of vines. We weren't even walking on the dirt. There was vine upon vine. It was like a big giant spaghetti about you know two inches uh, thick all over the ground. So you need to manually rip that out of the ground. Now you can cut it at the base of a tree, but it's going to grow back from that. You know, I'm an accredited organic landscape guy and uh, I'm not a fan of chemicals. Uh, you can you can continue to cut it every time it pokes out. You will eventually exhaust its its sugar reserves, its carb reserves to uh, that are in its roots. Um, that takes a lot of energy, it takes a lot of time. Uh, you can take the tiniest amount of an herbicide and not spray it, but just dab it on the cut end. Um, for instance, autumn olive is even more aggressive and really the only solution we have other than getting in there with a, uh, with a backhoe and, and getting every last bit of that root out. That's kind of your, that's really your best bet. Being very, very sparing with, uh, uh, with it, but that does the trick. You can also try to smother it and bury it under cardboard and then maybe a couple of layers of cardboard and uh, maybe about three or four inches of, uh, uh, of mulch. And anything that can pop up through that, you can chop and wait for it to come back and play the game that way. But you put a blanket on it that's certainly going to smother the heck out of it. Hope that helps. Good luck with that. All right, and we have a question from Brenda as to what society gives away free seeds? Um, so the Native Plant Society, if you're a member uh, in your local state, they do have uh, seed swaps. Um, you can go online. There's a number of uh, uh, Facebook groups that are uh, really devoted to uh, native plants. And you could ask, hey, who's got some extra seeds that I could have? Um, the one that I had mentioned specifically is the uh, North Carolina Botanical Gardens. Um, if you do a Google search for them, their wildflower of the year, um, when they announce it, they go ahead and uh, uh, you can swing by there in Raleigh or uh, that area, uh, Durham, uh, and, and pick up a pack. Of course, with COVID, it's only uh, you send a self-addressed stamped envelope to them and they'll go ahead and uh, send you some seeds. 
And we do have a comment from Nancy. She wants uh, us all to be aware that some passion vine that you can buy is not native and will not serve as a host plant. So be sure to get the native. That is great advice for all of these plants. So when you go and, and you see a name on a plant, um, not only is it potentially not the native version of it, right? Um, like I mentioned, Japanese maple or uh, Yoshino cherry, right? Yoshino, again, kind of gives you a little, little, uh, little hint that it's uh, Asian. Um, a lot of these plants, wisteria, right? There's the Asian wisteria, which is what we're uh, battling. Um, and the gentleman who asked earlier, or the, the caller asked earlier, but there is a native version. So uh, I, I can't stress it enough. You really need to know what you're buying. And a lot of times things are mislabeled. You know, they're just trying to sell stuff. And that's why you go to a reputable, good garden center um, and get a quality product that's also not sprayed. You know, I can't tell you how disappointed I am when we're trying to raise caterpillars, right? Monarch caterpillars. And lo and behold, we're running out of milkweed because they eat that stuff. I mean, that's really their job is to pretty much decimate the plant to become more. And that's wonderful. You're sacrificing the plant. Guess what? It's going to come back next year. But you might not have enough leaves for all of the caterpillars that, uh, that, are, that are eating. Well, you go to some of these stores and you're like, hey, do you have milkweed? Yeah, we sure do. Great. I'll buy them. By the way, do you spray your plants? Oh, yeah, we had some bugs on them. So we sprayed them. Well, I can't buy them because it's going to kill my caterpillars at home. So, you know, they're selling plants that invite insects to just basically to die. So it's, it's very disappointing. Again, go to a reputable place, not only make sure you're getting the native, but also make sure you're getting them without them having herbicide or other insecticides waiting for your pollinators to come land on it and basically be killed. All right, Lesha had uh, asked what were some places to get good source of, or what was the source of plants that you shared? And she was answered um, by Christine with Ross Farms on North Community Road is a good place. Yeah, I'm a big fan of Ross Farms. I do, uh, we do a lot of business with them. Um, the fact that they have bees right on site, um, it's great when I'm doing pollinator gardens, I built pollinator gardens for beekeepers. And of course, uh, I absolutely have to uh, be sure that I've got plants that do not have insecticides on them. Uh, I know they just don't because they have bees themselves. Um, so they don't have that on their property. It's fantastic. Like those, those guys a lot. All right, let's see. We've got uh, work, um, milkweed also from Ross Farms. Is that another place? Have yeah, they have them. Um, you know, again, there's depending on where you where where you live. Uh, if you're if you're here in town, um, but uh, really, no matter where you are, you know, that's the one the one reasonable thing that we've uh, gotten a little bit of a gift with all of us being on Zoom. We have people from from all over that are uh, that are watching this tonight or going to watch it uh, in the future on the recording. Uh, make sure to interview the people that you're buying your plants from. You know, when you call them, find out their garden practices, find out if they've grown it themselves, find out uh, if they spray, um, find out how they produce the plant that you're going to put in your garden to invite, you know, uh, uh, insects and pollinators uh, to your property. Okay, and uh, we have a question from Beth. We have two compost bins. However, is there a recipe for making good compost to put out onto the yard. Without what? Um, there is a recipe for, is there a recipe for making good compost to put out into the yard? Oh yeah, to put out in the yard. Yeah, I mean, basically everything from your kitchen um, that uh, doesn't have salt, that doesn't have uh, fats like meat, cheese, and dairy, that stuff will decompose, but it'll just get stinky along the, you know, in the process and no one wants that. Um, so all your, all your veggie cuttings, I'm not a fan of breads. Again, they have a lot of salt, they have a lot of other stuff in it. it. Takes a while for that to decompose. Although the, the moldier and the grosser, the better, um, cause you're already starting to decompose and uh, process, right? Uh, but Basically putting everything in there, I'm a fan of vermicomposting with, uh, with worms, 
because they go through that stuff uh, nice and fast. And the more insects that you get in your compost bin, uh, generally the better. You know, you have slugs in there. That's the best place to have slugs. Uh, in your garden, not so much, but, uh, uh, you know, they're helping decompose. Uh, so uh, that's a good place. There are a number of different kinds of flies that, uh, and, and even wasps that will help uh, and, and be in your compost bin. I can appreciate some folks not so much of a fan of that. But all of the cuttings that you have, all your vegetable scraps, um, all the, the pieces, like all the cores from your apples, uh, all of that goes in there. Uh, all the paper bags that you, uh, that you might get, uh, you, can, you can put in there as well. I like to put things in the freezer. So I take a little paper bag. So if you go get yourself some, uh, you know, some fast food or whatnot, sandwich comes in a paper bag. Uh, and then you've got a couple of strawberries that have gotten a little too soft. Throw those in, all of your banana peels. I throw them in my freezer. Um, so when that bag fills up, I take that bag out. And meanwhile, you know, no flies or anything in my kitchen, uh, no funky smells or anything like that. And when it freezes, the cell walls break. When it goes into the compost and thaws out, it's already turning to mush. So you're already helping that decomposition, uh, if you will. But all of those things, leaves, if you don't treat your uh, yard, which I hope you don't, um, and you have some grass clippings, not too much grass clipping. Grass clipping, stuff that's really green like that is gonna have a lot of nitrogen and it gets really, really hot. So those you wanna sprinkle. All the rest of it, the leaves and whatnot, you can just toss on in there. But uh, yeah, composting is a lot of fun. That's, uh, um, and, but I enjoy the lazy way of doing it. You know, you, you kind of just dig yourself a little hole in the middle of it, throw your bag of, of goodies in there and just bury it. And then the next time you go back out there, that's already gone and you just keep burying stuff uh, in the middle of it. All right, we have uh, one raised hand. So oh, we have two raised hands, excuse me. So um, if I guess our guests want to go ahead and uh, unmute themselves and ask directly. Rini, I'm not sure that they can. I think you might have to uh, allow. Ah, them. okay. You might have and, to. And while, while you find that, Rini, there was another question in the, in the, uh, in the chat uh, from, from Beth. Uh, how do you use compost to decompact your grass? Just spread on the top or will I have to kill my grass and work into the soil? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, I'm a fan of uh, aerating. And then uh, now you've opened up these pores about an inch and a half, right? These plug areas. And you can go ahead and spread compost uh, about a quarter inch thick into a lawn if you're talking about grass. And... Um, you know, just kind of rake it through and the grass will just pop back out of it. Um, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to smother it, but you can take compost and just scatter it, you know, handfuls at a time, any time of year and just throw it out there and it'll just go ahead and, uh, and grow through it. And you're adding all of these good beneficial things. By the way, I didn't mention coffee grounds earlier. Um, that's a really good one to toss into your in your compost. Quite honestly, I know people who just take the coffee grounds, just throw them under, you know, each, each brew each day is a different bush or around a different tree. So you can throw those around uh, out, out into your yard as well. Okay, Anne, go ahead with your question. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. I've got little tiny red worms in my compost. Um, just real tiny, are those good worms? <laughs> um, and is that good compost? I'm a, I'm a lazy composter. I just put everything in the bin and eventually sometimes I go through it. And I, I do want to get more um, intentional about it. But in the meantime, how about those worms? Yeah, for the most part, I mean, if they look like your normal garden variety uh, worms, whether they're small or not, there are a lot of different kind of earthworms. Now, the one for you guys to keep your eye on earlier, I had mentioned to you when you go to the garden shop, you know, take the plant out of the pot and look at it, smell the roots. One of the other things that you should do is look in and mostly it's going to be at the bottom. That's where the worms are going to hang out. It's the coolest spot. Um, what you're looking for is a particular worm. It's a flathead worm. You guys all know what a flathead 
uh, a hammerhead rather um, hammerhead shark looks like. Well, the head of this worm, and it's a fairly long worm, kind of flat um, in its uh, uh, appearance, but the head itself looks like a hammerhead. Um, those are an, uh, an invasive uh, worm. So if you see anything like that, you definitely want to squish it and squish it a lot because those actually, <laughs> amazingly enough, are uh, the kind that you cut them in half and they come back. Uh, so uh, don't just cut them in half, but you got to do some squishing, which if you got a little frustration, it works, but look for those. But if they're not those, then you're probably in good shape. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, let's see, back to the chat. We're... Oops. All right, back to the chat and we did, oops, <laughs> sorry. Um, we did have a question about eliminating tree of heaven and kudzu. Yeah, so kudzu is actually surprisingly easier um, it's a fast grower. You can, you know, it, it does produce a, uh, a, a, a pretty and a, and a nice uh, flower. Problem is that it ends up eating your whole um, habitat and just smothering it. So you gotta uh, reach down and find where it's coming out of the ground. It'll have a crown, almost like a little potato. And if you get that potato out of the ground, you've got it. Otherwise, if, uh, if it's just so overwhelming, again, cutting it and just using a sponge to apply some concentrate uh, herbicide and just dabbing it on there, again, not broadcasting it everywhere, but just on that cut end uh, is going to be your answer on the, on the kudzu. Um, the, the tree of heaven, great marketing, right? Um, horrible, horribly invasive here. Um, Heavenly bamboo is another great marketing, terrible plant for us. Uh, that's an Andina. Um, both of those require, um, you know, the, the, the mimosa tree is what we're talking about and, and the Andina. So you, you've got to uh, cut them down as they start to sprout back up. You, you chop on the trees a little bit easier because you can, you can get a stump grinder and, and grind that out. Uh, the, the, uh, the Nandina is a type of bamboo, uh, and which is considerably uh, tougher. Uh, but again, it, their roots aren't as terrible as traditional bamboo that just uh, is really very, very labor intensive. But uh, Nandina, uh, you, can, you can get with a, with a shovel. You should be able to uh, handle that without it using herbicides at all. Good all right, we also, we, we also had a question about Bradford pear. Yeah, that's an interesting one. You know, uh, city of Charlotte and a lot of municipalities around the country were giving those away for free, particularly after we had Hugo back in uh, uh, 89, 90, something like that. Um, and we lost so many trees and uh, we thought it was a good tree, grew fast, had pretty white flowers on it. Unfortunately, it's offspring, what it pollinates, um, makes a tree that has uh, tremendous, um, tremendously strong thorns on it. And not only that, but they're also very invasive. So getting to it and to deal with it um, is yet one more big obstacle. So a lot of people don't like the smell of the blooms on them. Uh, they break fairly easy. Things that grow really fast break and decompose very quickly. Um, so on a big storm, half of one of those trees that Bradford pear will be laying on the ground. Um, and then of course you got to go and chop it away, uh, get rid of the rest of it. But those are fairly easy trees to kill, um, but unfortunately they are invasive. So if you do have one, for instance, if it's on city property uh, or in a right of way, you call the city to trim it, they will come and just remove the whole tree. They're on a mission to get rid of all the calorie pears, the Bradford pears uh, out of the Charlotte area. It's a uh, you see them on the highways. I mean, they're just super invasive. Yeah, so I'm glad to hear that you're talking about getting rid of it. Please do. Okay, I just want to mention that if anyone else uh, has a question and or if you had your hand raised, probably easier just to put it in the Q&A or the chat. Uh, so let's see, we've got a lot of thank yous for a great presentation. 
Great. And I think we may be coming up on um, the end of this. Uh, let's see, uh, we have someone who says they had a nice vine pop up in the yard. They decided to keep it. Uh, the vine looked like a passion vine, but uh, miniaturized. And the passion flower uh, are white. The passion flowers are white. Um, they also got small fruits on it. Looks like a miniature um, may pops. I don't know what. Yeah, um, that's right. Okay. So, you know, one of the things I'd encourage you to do is um, don't be too quick uh, with your clippers. Find out what you're dealing with because that thing's not going to take over your yard in a season. Um, you know, kudzu, even kudzu won't take over your yard in a season, but there's a great app I like to use. Uh, it's called iNaturalist. It's free. You can get it for whatever phone you have. Uh, the letter I and then naturalist. And you take a picture, you put it into it and say, what did I you know, what did I see? What did I find? And it'll give you a number, whether it's a plant, uh, uh, an insect, uh, 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 an animal, um, it'll identify it for you and, or give you options and a bunch of pictures to be able to see, is this what you have? I would encourage you guys to do that with insects. Every insect that you find, particularly caterpillars, um, the answer with the caterpillars, unless you find like a thousand of them, it doesn't matter what kind of caterpillar it is, it's fine. Just leave it. Um, I know a lot of folks who grow tomatoes and cabbage and, 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 and cucumbers and squash and that kind of thing. You know, we have a bunch of beetles that'll come in there. Now, if you get a chicken, uh, you won't have that problem at all. So I would say you don't have a beetle problem. I say you have a lack of chicken problem. Um, so, you know, there are not too many people going to go out and get a chicken. I can appreciate that, but that's really the solution. Um, but if you just have a few, it's not. Ultimately, it's not that big a deal, but that is bird food. Um, so the more birds you can invite to your yard with bird feeders, nair that, invite the birds to come and hang out and eat all those things. Um, so identify what it is and then deal with a little bit of damage. A little bit of damage is not going to be a problem. Um, a lot of damage, like with a canker worm issue that we had here in Charlotte a few years back, uh, that got out of control. And... Uh, they were coming out so early, the bird migration hadn't come yet. So they're damaging these trees and really putting a hurt on them and actually killing some trees. So we banded them and now we don't need to band those anymore. So if you're still banding your oak trees and whatnot, you don't need to. Uh, you want a few canker worms, little bits fine. Those are just, those are just little tiny caterpillars. Um, you just don't want a whole lot of them. Um, so when it gets out of control, that's why you want to invite those, those birds. We want to protect those because they take care of a lot of pest management for us. Hope that helps. All right. We've got one um, that is asking, uh, what, speci what specific plants, trees, bugs, does Charlotte need the most right now? Uh, the number one answer is caterpillars of all kinds. Um, that is the number one food source to have more birds. And so, you know, this time of year, you put out seeds, uh, adult birds, or what you see in the, uh, in the spring and summer, uh, they need a lot, a lot of insects to feed those babies and to raise them uh, big enough. So uh, the, the best that you can do, and of course, the, the, the ones that are the, the, the most beautiful are these native plants that support um, all these pretty butterflies. Um, some of them, of course, have their defense mechanisms, like the monarch. Birds aren't going to eat those because they know that's why they're really bright and, and showy. They want to be seen, and that's why their mimics try to do and try, try and be the same, because birds already have figured out, oh, my God, those things taste terrible, and they're not going to eat them. Uh, but all sorts of other insects, and the way you have a lot of insects is a lot of plants that you don't spray. So quite honestly, if you encourage your neighbors to quit with the mosquito sprays that take out, uh, it's, it's basically a nuclear bomb uh, for the day and it takes everything out. Um, and then whatever its residual capacity is, it keeps taking them out. So if you happen to see your neighbor that you just can't convince to, uh, to stop with the spray, pay attention to who's applying it. It is illegal for them to apply it to a bloom of any kind. So if you see them applying it, uh, you go and you can call uh, the, the, the city 
um, and I would just call the owner of the company. I just call the company and threaten to call the regulators and they'd lose their pesticide application license. Um, they're not allowed to apply that stuff to a blooming because the bloom obviously is gonna attract insects. And if they're pretending that they're spraying for mosquitoes, well, mosquitoes aren't going after that bloom. They're coming after us, they're coming after the dog, they're coming after, right? They're, they're looking for a blood meal. Um, oh, there is something I wanted to teach you guys. And matter of fact, uh, Talamy talks about it in his new book. Um, I've been talking about it longer, so I'm trying to compete there. But in any case, get yourself a bucket or a kiddie pool and uh, you can put some leaves in it. You wanna get the water a little funky, not gross and not terrible, um, but we were using it to clean the dog's feet and we didn't change the water. The water got a little funky and you notice that the mosquitoes really liked it. They were laying their eggs in it and you know they get these little shrimpy larva kind of jiggling around in that water. Well, you can go to uh, even Lowe's and Home Depot sell mosquito dunks. It's basically a bacteria in a dunk, so it's slow release. You just toss it in that bucket or toss it into your little kiddie pool and it wipes out just the mosquito larva. So you can make yourself a giant mosquito trap. I'd encourage you not to do it right by your back door because you're inviting all the mosquitoes there. Um, do it somewhere in the yard, um, but just don't forget to keep throwing in a mosquito dunk every few weeks and it's very inexpensive and you will have yourself thousands upon thousands of mosquitoes that you would have gotten and killed in that water. Um, and frogs like it, just make sure to put a couple of sticks in there. So frogs or salamanders or whatever that decide to jump in there have a way to get out of that kiddie pool or out of your bucket. Um, but that's a great way to remove the mosquitoes so your neighbors don't need to spray for mosquitoes. Um, but don't put those things like in a creek uh, that those they're not meant for open water. You know, there are uh, some other things that they uh, uh, will affect, but like in a bucket, it's only going to affect mosquitoes, mosquito larvae. It's not going to kill the adults, but you won't get those subsequent generations and generations all summer long. All right. Uh, we also have a question about the scientific name for native wisteria. Ah. <laughs> uh, if you do a Google search, I'm terrible with the Latin names. They're tough. Uh, yeah, if you do a Google search for American Wisteria, um, it will, it'll be. Now, I'm a big fan of NC State. Uh, so if you do a Google search on any plant name and then put NCSU at the end, uh, they're a big horticultural school and their web pages are fantastic. They even tell you about the poison or the flammability uh, status of a particular plant. So if you've got a wood sided house, you may not want to plant certain plants um, like native honeysuckle is actually, I wouldn't put it on a, on a, on a wooden house. Conveniently in Charlotte, we're not really uh, in a high fire risk, but if you're further out West or whatnot, um, they'll even tell you if, if that plant has a flammability rating. So NCSU, NC State University, um, do a Google search for that and you'll, you'll find all the information you've ever wanted to know about a particular plant. Really good resource. Here's an interesting one from someone who says their compost had maggots this year. Is that a good or bad thing? Yeah, you see, I'm, I'm a fan. And so one of the things that you can do, um, you know, I know people are a little squeamish about touching that. That's just larva, really. Um, they're not necessarily good or bad. Depends on what was in, in your um, uh, in your compost, certainly if you put any meat in there, it's going to uh, attract, you know, kind of like that common fly. Uh, but other maggots, uh, also great bird food. So uh, sometimes if I get a bunch, I'll just scoop them out, put them in a dish and put it right there by uh, the bird feeder. And, uh, and they appreciate that. So the answer is yes, that's good. We've got a question about, uh, is there a good vine that you can plant or weave into an existing chain link fence that can act as a better natural barrier and give you around natural privacy? Uh, this um, urban living about five minutes from Uptown Charlotte. Yeah, so you know, there's a, uh, there's a bunch of native plants, uh, native vines. Um, for the most part, they're fairly deciduous. Uh, that native with, uh, excuse me, the native honeysuckle, gorgeous, gorgeous plant. That's somewhat, it hangs on to some of its leaves. Uh, the uh, 
it's a lot of people call it uh, Carolina Jasmine. It's not Jasmine. It's a Jessamine. Uh, that's a great one. It needs a haircut a lot. So uh, you do kind of need to get on it to uh, to trim it. Uh, there are some some of the vines, you know, they get a little they get a little wild. So it depends on the kind of look that you're looking for. If you don't mind it being a little sloppy and, uh, and out there. Um, Carolina jessamine is one of my favorite. Uh, it's, it's a meat plant, very robust. It, it'll, it'll certainly fill uh, your, your fence uh, very quickly. There's some that can get pretty uh, outrageous. Uh, you know, the passion vine is, is a good one. Um, I've heard some people recommend that you take a big pot, plant it there so it doesn't kind of creep out throughout your garden. Um, I like it a little on the wild side, uh, the, the style. I don't like, you know, the, the, to have to maintain, again, we we're talking about being a lazy gardener. Um, I don't like to have to trim things uh, and, and keep them squared up and trimmed. So I, I like that kind of wild look, you know. All right, we've got a comment that uh, Mecklenburg County has free fresh mulch until the end of January. Mm -hmm. They do have delivery options available. Also bagged compost is now available as well. Uh, you just go to wipeoutwaste.com for locations. Yeah, so we've got the, the, uh, the compost that they make is actually certified organic. It's very, very good quality. Um, and uh, I, know the, I know the person that runs their, uh, their program there. And uh, so they have four facilities around town, the full service recycling centers where you can bring your TVs and everything else. They also, you can bring your tree stumps and all that kind of thing. Well, they turn all of that stuff into mulch and the leaves and grass and everything into compost. Um, and it's very nice, um, very fluffy, very well uh, sifted and, and filtered through. You're gonna find little bits of trash, unfortunately, in pretty much uh, all mulch and whatnot nowadays, because uh, again, people throw their, they put plastic bags on the side of the road with, you know, on the curb with all their grass clippings and that. And so folks have to like, rip that open. And eventually some of that plastic is going to get in there, but, uh, but it is very good quality and uh, they've got a lot of it, right? A lot of people were gardening. Unfortunately, a lot of people still put their leaves on the curb. Uh, but at least that stuff's not going in landfills anymore. They're making a good product out of it. So yeah, if you have an opportunity, if you've got a truck, I'd definitely go out there and, and get yourself some for your yard. All right. Um, what eats the orange or yellow aphids that eat milkweed? Yeah, you know, that's kind of interesting. Um, I've not had a problem with them, uh, but the easiest solution is you go get your hose and... Uh, and you just set it on a, on a setting and you just blast them off the plant. Um, you know, everything does have a predator. I'm not particularly uh, familiar. I know that, uh, that those are specific uh, uh, aphids, not your traditional little green ones that are on our other plants. And uh, so they can tolerate the sap and whatnot in a milkweed. Uh, but the best thing to do is, uh, is just to, to knock them off um, you know, get out there with a little rubber glove or, or not, and you can just squish them as well. And you can knock their populations down dramatically, uh, very, very quickly, but they're not really so terrible for the plant. You know, I mean, if, if you're seeing a real decline in the plant, then, you know, maybe address it, but otherwise again, revert to, you know, rule number one, be a lazy gardener and, uh, and, and let it be if, uh, if you have to address it you know, squishing them or, or shooting them with the, uh, with a, with a little bit of stream of water and making them work to get back onto the plant. That's my, uh, that's my recommendation for you. Uh, and we have a question about an easy, sustainable way to have a water source for insects in the yard. Yeah. So, you know, butterflies are a big fan. They like, uh, they like rotting fruit, um, and, uh, and little puddles like mud puddles. Um, so if you have a saucer, uh, a big saucer, you know, pot for a saucer or saucer rather for a pot, um, fill it with some gravel, let it rain, let the sprinklers hit it, hit it with your water hose, whatever. Um, that's a great one because it lets them get somewhere uh, to, it gives them an opportunity to land and not fall in. You know, that, that, uh, that kiddie pool mosquito trap that we were talking about. Um, 
I always have branches all in there uh, to give an opportunity for bees to land on the branch and then they'll go and drink out of that water and then and fly away. So uh, again, I'm a big fan of that, except you just wanna make sure that you've got some of that mosquito dunk in there because that'll be, again, a mosquito. Any little standing water, they will go ahead and, uh, and lay their eggs in. So it's really a good, great opportunity for you to go ahead and, and wipe out that next generation. All right, well, this I believe is our last question. Uh, Virginia remarks that she was really surprised by the number of black swallow tail caterpillars on the fennel she planted. Is there another plant that attracts different caterpillar species? I have milkweed for monarchs and end up with a large uh, batch and not enough at the end of the season last year. Fennel was uh, hardy enough though. Yeah, they, they like the things that we, uh, that we like to eat too, right? Um, big challenge, of course, is, is deer going after them. I and deer will pretty much eat anything when, it gets, uh, when they get hungry enough. So planting a bunch of it. So you're really fortunate you've got a, a good population of, uh, of, of butterflies and uh, you know, encourage your neighbors to plant a whole bunch of, uh, of fennel uh, as well. It is amazing the different plants uh, that, uh, and I'm not a butterfly expert, but, uh, uh, you know, it, it's fun to know that, hey, don't cut down that sweet gum, because uh, I know you may not love that tree, you don't like raking up those little balls, but you get luna moths from it. Uh, but I don't know all of the different, there's, there's just too much, too much to know. Um, but uh, I will encourage you, you would, fantastic, uh, uh, book for exactly that is Bringing Nature Home and more recently uh, Talamy's uh, newest book because his whole his whole mantra is really around caterpillars, moss, and butterflies, uh, Lepidoptera. Um, that genus is what we need, caterpillars. And so he talks about plant this, you get this. Plant this other plant, you get this. And uh, and that NC NC uh, State University, they'll talk about what plants are hosts to what as well. Um, uh, the, the group I was gonna recommend, the name of it uh, escapes me for a moment, but uh, uh, they're butterfly uh, escapes. If you do uh, butterfly organizations, you'll be able to find uh, what host plants or what, uh, what caterpillars and what butterflies and moths. Uh, but I'm delighted to hear that you've got them. That means that you're not spraying your yard with a whole bunch of poison. So congratulations on that. I really thank all of you for, uh, for sticking with us uh, this long. Great questions. And uh, don't ever hesitate to reach out if there's anything I can help you with, by all means. Um, uh, and I'm delighted to see uh, Sierra Club uh, doing all the wonderful things that they do, uh, as well as to help us get to uh, yesterday's uh, lovely events as well. And I wish all of you uh, best of luck in your ecology efforts. Have a great night. All right. I just want to mention that, yes, we will post the recording. And you can find that on our website, charlottesierraclub.org. Take care, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Thank you.